So next, I would like to introduce Craig McLucky. And so he's a name that I'm sure many of you know. Uh, so he is currently the CEO and founder of Heptio, and he's bringing, uh, bringing Kubernetes to the world. Uh, he was actually working uh, previously at Google, where he helped found the Kubernetes project. And in addition, he founded CNCF to help bring much to the open source world as well. And you'll be talking about practical multi-cloud. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Hey, folks. Welcome. Um, thanks so much for having me. It's always fun to chat to a, a technical audience. Um, I'm hoping I can. There we go. Um, I'm so in love with this background that I, I decided not to do my normal kind of uh, photo essay. So you're going to have to like, look, watch it a lot. But um, what I wanted to talk to you about uh, today is cloud, multi-cloud. And this is a topic that's come up a lot for me recently. You know, I've, I've obviously spent a decent amount of time uh, kind of in the cloud space. I worked on Compute Engine before uh, working on Kubernetes. Um, and now as a, you know, as a sort of private little company, um, I spend a lot of time talking to people who are trying to make their way through this cloud world, like really understand it. And uh, in particular, multi-cloud just keeps coming up a lot. And there's two kind of themes here that I keep kind of encountering in the, in the field. Uh, one is understanding the capabilities. You know, this, you know, cloud is there to deliver a quality of service. Cloud is there to solve some problems. And people are trying to see how multi-cloud fits into that kind of capability spectrum. Uh, so I'll spend some time talking about that. And then the other thing that keeps coming up is availability. You know, people are looking at you know, cloud as an increasingly essential part of their uh, story as software becomes more central to their business. And they look at multi-cloud as ways to achieve better availability outcomes. And so I'll talk about that too. So uh, this is kind of my one uh, sort of warning. I'm, not, I'm hardly unbiased. Like, uh, you know, take everything I say with a bit of a pinch of salt. Like, uh, I obviously work on Kubernetes, and my company's ground in Kubernetes. So I love Kubernetes, and I see it as a solution to almost every problem under the sun. So just uh, maintain that perspective, and uh, just kind of feel a little skeptical, maybe push back. Um, but you know, as, as you're starting to look at this kind of multi-cloud world, and I think Abby articulated this, you know, in many ways, Cloud Foundry is uh, a similar sort of base of technology to something like Kubernetes. Um, Platform agnostic, agnostic technologies are extraordinarily helpful as you're looking to kind of tackle this multi-cloud world. Um, and I'll, I'll pull this through occasionally through this presentation, though hopefully I'll leave it to your imagination to figure out. So let's get going. Um, I think as you look at the problem, it's worth really understanding what the ethos of cloud is. So it started, and certainly for me, and I think for most people, cloud solves this problem of infrastructure provisioning and management. You know, for a lot of people, it starts that idea of infrastructure as a service. And you know, it, it really evolved into a situation where you could uh, decommission your infrastructure, decommission your operations teams, and have somebody else solve that problem for you. And that's great, particularly as you look at the cloud providers have these amazing economies of scale. Uh, they're able to act, you know, they have a tremendous buying power. They're able to operate uh, very efficiently. Uh, and that gives them a, a leg up in that. But the second thing to realize is that cloud is more than that. It's also, at the heart of it, every service, whether it's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, um, SaaS, software as a service, you're basically taking a technology, you're combining it with this expert operations team, you're delivering it as a service behind a provisioning API, a provisioning and integration API. And that means that your developers now have access to something new that's at the other side of an API instead of it being the other side of a ticket. Prior to cloud, you'd have a ticket. You'd file a ticket, and then if you were lucky, two weeks later, a VM would show up and you could party on. Like that, it's very different today, right? But there's something that's, I think, more profound than that. I mean, that's, that's changed life for developers everywhere. But there's something that's even more profound, which is it's also a way to get to your technology as a service. So if you start thinking about some of the patterns that cloud has pioneered, this idea that you can take a technology, add an expert operations team, put it behind an API, deliver it to people, um, that's true for a lot of enterprises. You know, and obviously, if you're a SaaS startup and you're in the audience, um, you, know, you live in this world, and that's, this is kind of exactly what we are. But more and more, people who are building traditional enterprise IT systems have an opportunity to start, of themselves, start to think of themselves as a service provider, rather than someone who's throwing big IT software over the wall and uh, hoping that the business is there to catch it. So when I look at uh, you know, cloud topology, the structure of how people are kind of you know, thinking about their cloud strategy, there's two competing forces that are in effect right now. 
the one, the one force that I think people haven't fully internalized is just the remarkable economies of scale that exist in the world of the cloud providers. It's not just about having you know, teams that can focus on delivering something and achieving economies of scale like that. It translates to raw buying power. And this is getting more and more skewed as time goes on. The cloud providers are buying a disproportional amount of the world's physical infrastructure. It gives them a disproportional line of control over the people who are providing that infrastructure to them. It gives them a disproportional amount of impact on the design of those next generation systems. Right? It's worth understanding this. Today, you can absolutely get some economies of scale by taking technology, well, not so much economies of scale, you can actually get some price advantages by bringing technology back on-prem if you have relatively traditional workloads. But don't think that we've seen the end of the cloud economics, and, and don't discount this tipping point um, you know, as these cloud providers achieve this near sort of singularity state uh, that in many ways people like Google have existed for a while because they just consume so much infrastructure. So that's the one thing. On the other hand, there's something very different happening, which is we're starting to see this trend towards increasingly heterogeneous deployments. The real world is complex. There's a lot of interesting things happening. This is an IoT conference. We're starting to see a tremendous amount more interest in getting computational resources out to the edge. We're also seeing real businesses live in this increasingly heterogeneous world. You know, even if they don't want to be in a, you know, like one cloud provider like Amazon may achieve a level of singularity and, and sort of run away with the game. Most people don't want that. They actually want to be in this multi-provider relationship. And so there's these two tensions about you know, that singularity that might happen, and then on the flip side, the increasing needs to move compute to other places. So um, I'm going to start with some kind of perspective on public cloud. Like I, I, th I spend a lot of time thinking about this. And um, I think it's important to understand, like, you know, Amazon is amazing. Don't get me wrong. Like, Amazon has just done something spectacular. They've defined a genre. And if I had to pick one word for what they do, I'd say it's, it's just fast. You go to reInvent and you just feel the energy and the incredible execution acumen. And you look at the ecosystem and it, the sort of, you know, certainly I was a cloud provider for a while. Like I was coming, you know, sort of building a new uh, service to compete with EC2 back in the day. And I was like, good Lord, these guys are moving so fast, you know. Um, and they, they'd, they'd achieved so, you know, so much. And so, it would be foolish to ignore Amazon as a sort of incredible and dominant force. But I don't think it is a one-horse race, as I mentioned earlier. I think that there are other players in space here. Um, I look at Microsoft, and there's a lot of words you might pick to describe Microsoft's cloud. You know, you could, you could think about it uh, in terms of their ability to take stuff to market. You know, just the ability to tie it back to the existing businesses, the efficiency of the sales force, uh, their sort of execution acumen. Um, and one of the things that I see the most is trajectory, right? Like, I look back on where Microsoft was uh, 12, 12 months ago, and I mean, I'll be honest, it just wasn't a very good uh, basic service. You look at it today, it's come a long, long way. You look at their ability to keep their zones up, and uh, they've, they've come a long way. And Microsoft never stops executing. They never get tired, they never take the out the ball, they execute, execute, execute. And I think it, it would be foolish to not hold an option to you know, head in this direction. And then I picked a word for Google, and I'm going to go with Spanner. Um, I don't know if you know what Cloud Spanner is, right? Um, yeah, so uh, Google does amazing stuff. It's kind of like Google is phenomenal at bringing out these science fiction technologies. And I picked Spanner because it's, it's just a great example. So it's a distributed, sharded, transactional data store. It's introduced some really interesting technology to allow you to have transactional behavior in a globally distributed, sharded piece of infrastructure. And what they've done that's kind of interesting is they've, they've introduced this idea that you can balance the speed at which you can commit transactions with your understanding of how, uh, how sort of much time, you know, how close to sort of true time you are. They have this true time API, and uh, it can present this idea of like how close to, to true time you are. And uh, you know, CockroachDB and other um, systems can implement Paxos, but what makes it special is it's powered by these crazy atomic clocks. So they get the time variance down to almost nothing, which drives the performance out of, you know, completely out of the roof. Now, if you want something like that, there's only one place to get it. No one else has it. And it's not just this. Their network is remarkable. If you look at the way that TensorFlow runs on their uh, TPU infrastructure, it's remarkable. And so again, you know, while Google has had some teething problems, it would be foolish to not have an option to bet on them at some point. And so 
I think a lot about this idea of lock-in. I think a lot about vendor lock-in, and I think you should as well. And when people start saying lock-in, the first thing they mention is data lock-in. So it's like, hey, I want to be uh, careful about the data gravity, you know, the sort of the singularity that is once my data is in a cloud, I will never get it out because it's never going to leave. Well, there was this really interesting thing at this last reInvent. Amazon brought one of those big old Mac trucks on stage with a whole bunch of spinning hard drives, right? And right now, those Mac trucks only make one direction trips from your data center to the cloud. But we're one act of legislation away from being able to go the other way around, right? So data mobility, they've, they've proven that's a solved problem. The thing that's much more nuanced and dangerous to, uh, to developers is the idea of service locking. When you start to build your application around a set of services that are bespoke to a specific cloud provider, your ability to achieve mobility goes down considerably. Now, I'm not saying don't do it, right? I'm not, I think it would be foolish to ignore the utility of cloud-provided services. But what I'm saying is think about what you're doing. You know, there's a lot of different classes of services that exist. For instance, if you're betting on a cloud-provided service that's a simple managed manifestation of an open source technology, you really aren't that locked in. If you're looking at something like Amazon RDS, it's based on MySQL, you can squint at it and say, like, with a little bit of effort, I could move my application somewhere else. I'm not locked in. But there are services where there could be an open source alternative, but for some reason, the cloud provider has chosen not to deliver it. That is scary, right? Like, when I start to see services where, you know, like, this could absolutely be open source, the only reason the cloud provider wouldn't actually, you know, actually necessarily operate open source is because, why? Like, you know, probably because they actually value this idea of lock-in. So I tend to steer people away from these class of services that don't have a clean open source analog. And that's just something to, to think about. The thing that's more nuanced and perhaps a little more pernicious here is services that are accelerated by proprietary tech. Like Google's the king of this, right? They produce these amazing services that you just can't get anywhere else uh, unless you want to buy atomic clocks or actually you know, turn up your own uh, physical hardware. And that's going to be a real challenge for, um, for everyone. And so in this case, it's interesting. Like, you really need to think about it. There's a lot of advantage to using some of these technologies that just create disproportional value. There's some problems you can only solve with them. Just understand that you are making a pretty deep bet when you go down this path. So, um, so what to do about it? You know, obviously, be smart. Think about it. That's kind of what the, the previous slide was about. Um, but there are two things you can do, and I think Abby mentioned one of these. One of those things you can do is start to think about uh, managing your service integration framework, looking at creating a structured broker. And this is, I'm not talking to the individual developers, you know, like if, if you're an individual developer, you, you know, you, you can just be judicious. But I'm talking to the folks who are running IT teams or are sort of looking at the organization more broadly and trying to define policy and manage these things. If you broker the interactions between your cloud service and your infrastructure, uh, you accomplish two things. You create a very deliberate interface, and you can control who's using what. You can define policy. And so you can make sure that people aren't just willy-nilly getting locked in to a lot of these services. The other thing you can start to think about doing is like, hey, why not roll your own? Like, um, you know, again, I, I think about you know, platforms like Kubernetes as a great way for folks to actually get something that is pretty much operated for them. You know, that automation platform is actually delivering a lot of the value that the cloud providers would do. If you're a business, it's entirely reasonable to start thinking about turning up some of your own services and actually having your own little SRE teams that are running these services for you as a way to keep uh, an open hedge on what comes next. And also to get your uh, infrastructure you know, running everywhere. And you know, the one thing I, I just want to say before I kind of close out that section is that you know, back to that, that narrative around what, what is cloud, you know, like hybrid cloud, this cloud, that cloud. If your cloud is not delivering a way for you to create and run your own services, it really isn't a cloud, right? Because all it's doing is, is solving a basic, you know, infrastructure provisioning problem. You really need to think about um, that as you, as you look to the world. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, hybrid cloud and the things that are motivating people to, you know, this, this idea of, of uh, being able to run a portion of their workloads in a public cloud infrastructure, and then a portion of those uh, applications running on premises. And, and the obvious starting point, and this is like, it's funny, uh, like one of my first meetings with a, a CIO was, uh, he looked at me in the eye, this is when I was, I was building an infrastructure as a service offering, and he said, uh, you will pry my data centers out of my cold, dead hands, right? 
He was hugely invested in it. And a few years later, he was like, yeah, we're kind of into cloud, but we need to actually watch these, you know, we need to kind of get these assets fully depreciated. And for most people, there's this process whereby you may want to be fully public cloud, but you still have to deal with the realities of existing infrastructure assets. Um, the other thing, and I, I said this earlier, that's, that's driving people to think about hybrid cloud is economics. And I actually think this is a, a, a sort of a bad uh, thing to worry about right now because you're going to get on the wrong side of the, uh, of the cloud provider uh, economies of scale. But for certain classes of users and uh, you know, for certain you know, that are operating at a level of sophistication, there are legitimate cost advantages to running on-prem today. Like there's just no way to, to you, you, you do the economics, you look at the cost of these, these services, and it leads to the conclusion that infrastructure as a service margins are extremely high because you can get essentially something that looks a little bit like that uh, for a lot less than the cloud providers are selling it to you for. Um, the next thing that's kind of driving people into this hybrid space is, is regulation. Um, there's a lot of requirements around things like data locality, uh, maintaining you know, data you know, in certain proximities, uh, you know, and then even, you know, even some of the sort of more sort of in industry vertical uh, legislations sometimes make it challenging to get into the public cloud. So one of the things that a lot of folks that I'm speaking to are thinking about is ways to bring little bits of their workloads across you're creating solutions where you can take some of the less critical apps, get it out there, and then wait for the regulation to keep up. Because you know, the regulators, at the end of the day, are trying to kind of you know, create this balance between you know, velocity of an industry and bad outcomes. And you know, inevitably, they will, will head in that direction. The, third, the fourth thing here is um, you know, that's kind of motivating hybrid cloud for a lot of folks is, is edge. And you're probably going to hear a lot about this, uh, in, this in this facility. Um, as businesses are becoming more increasingly uh, IoT enabled. Um, as folks are starting to think about how to process information closer to the edge, so that you're not putting tremendous pressure on, on the kind of global network fabric as these, as these like highly connected devices are coming online, it's creating new challenges for organizations. You know, being able to have a common set of tools that you can run some amount of your workload at the edge, some amount in the public cloud, maybe some in your existing um, data centers is, is kind of key. And then the last piece of it is, uh, is availability. Um, this is always interesting to folks. And um, it's a good segue into what's happening next, which is you know, how do I position myself so that I'm relatively uh, buffered from, from bad outcomes from an availability perspective? So let's jump into that for a bit. Um, now, I think about IT as this kind of, like, I, I tend to think about much of life as a kind of optimization problem. I tend to look at my happiness as an area under curve optimization problem. And uh, I think modern IT is kind of is kind of the same thing, but it's an interesting it's an interesting tension, right? The one side, IT's job is to go as fast as possible, get technology out there, serve the business, help the business be um, highly differentiated and successful. Um, but they have to do it within a certain risk posture, and often as not, that's kind of a binary thing, which is like, will I get fired or won't I get fired? Will there be a bad outcome? Won't there be a bad outcome? A lot of these sort of risk constraints are relatively immutable, and you have to get to a point where you know, whether you are legitimately, you at least are being observed to kind of manage the risk. And then within that, you're trying to achieve the highest, uh, you know, well, it's not so much the highest possible level of SLA. You want to go as fast as you can, but achieve an acceptable level of SLA. Like, the, the easiest way to never break anything is to never change anything. That's obviously a, a suboptimal outcome, right? So you can get almost perfect availability if you just never change anything. Um, and so at the end of the day, you're trying to balance these two things. And that leads to, you know, you're hitting some availability goals. And there's like these two key components to availability, and it's really important to separate them out because one you have more control over than the other, one you have much better chances of measuring than the other, and uh, often as not, people optimize on one of these at the expense of the other to their peril. So the first is obviously mean time to failure. So like my application is walking along, and occasionally it stumbles. You know something bad happens, and then I have mean time to recovery. How long does it take me to get back up again? And availability is approximately, you know, how long does it take for something bad to happen? You know, like how long is everything great? Over how long does it take to, you know, for it to be great and then become great again? And that, that gives you that sort of approximate availability. And if you want to get perfect availability, you kind of have to manage these two things down, right? Manage down the, t the, the amount of time it takes between incidents. And then when an incident happens, manage the amount of time down it takes to get you back up and running again. And MTTF, the mean time to failure, like how long things are between uh, 
between instances is kind of interesting because it stacks, right? Any, any number of bad things happening will create an application outage. It could be a provider issue, like you had that Amazon S3 outage that was uh, unfortunate the other day. Uh, it could be an operations issue where something gets broken in, in your configuration that's underlying, your, uh, affecting your, your base infrastructure. Or it could be an application issue where you have a memory leak and then you know, something kind of goes sideways at the end of the day. And for most people that I see, the reality is application level failures tend to dominate the equation. Most people, uh, you know, they think that they're going to have a lot of problems with the cloud provider or some of the other pieces of infrastructure. But for most realistic applications, this tends to dominate the, 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 the equation. And at the end of the day, the thing that breaks everything effectively is, is change. You know, there are certain classes of bugs where you know, things will go sideways over time because of a memory leak or some other uh, issue. You do certainly have infrastructure failures. But at the end of the day, it's mostly someone breaking, it's mostly something, you know, an operator breaks something, they, they fat finger something. And the thing that I'd, I'd like to kind of observe here is that, um, you know, you have, a, like, you think you have a lot of control over this, but you may not have as much control as, over it as you think. Um, Often as not, you just haven't seen that five standard deviation event yet. You don't know what the future holds. The world that you're walking into with your MTTF is not necessarily representative of the world that you've been living in over time. And, you know, obviously the way that you can kind of manage down the MTTF is, is to start thinking about failure domains and creating systems that stretch across failure domains. So you're basically managing the blast radius associated with any kind of outage events. And you know, within that, it can be relatively simple. Like you know, you have the, the minimalist idea, which is you know, isolated deployments, even in the same zone. You know, two things essentially that are decoupled, running uh, the same thing, gives you some level of availability. Uh, and then you obviously have the zonal availability, where you know, a cloud provider will chew up their data center into relatively isolated pieces. Regional availability, so that a cloud provider might give you something where. Uh, if a hurricane sweeps through and, and destroys a data center, uh, you can have things running somewhere else. And then there's this other thing, which is provider uh, sort of availability. You know, like what happens if uh, a cloud provider has a, a really bad outage? We haven't seen one of those yet, but, but what, what would happen then? And so, you know, folks are definitely, I encourage them to think about this. But there's an interesting kind of um, corollary here, which is, ironically, the more you effort you put into trying to achieve higher and higher and higher levels of, of distribution, it introduces an ironic amount of complexity that's going to impact you know, other parts of the application, which is like your MTTR here. So mean time to recovery uh, is something that, ironically, you can control. Right? This is something you can practice. You can take an application and you can shoot it in a, in a test environment and see if you can bring it back up. You can create playbooks. Uh, you can rely on technologies like you know, Kubernetes that will actively observe your application level failures and will bring that application back online for you. Right? You have a lot of, of control over this. And ironically, often as not, your MTTR, the time it takes you to get back up on your feet and running, is inversely proportional to the complexity of the application you're building. Right? So, so many people I see get carried away with this idea that I'm going to build this mega robust, crazy awesome system. And they introduce complexity that introduces correlated failure modes. It actually drives down their uh, MTTR uh, significantly and, uh, and can ironically sometimes drive up the MTTF as well. So just think about that as you're designing your systems. Um, also rec you know, recognize that when you're starting to think about availability and particularly deployments that are spanning these, these topologies, um, operators and correlated failures are a really bad outcome. If you look at the post-mortems, I read every, every time there's a cloud outage, I go read the post-mortem. And the vast majority of the time, it's some poor operator fat-fingered a command and pushed a bad configuration to too many servers or this environment or something like that. Um, and as you start looking at introducing federation technologies that let you start to span the multi-cloud you know, uh, in a perfect fashion, um, you're adding a lot of moving parts and you're giving the operators a very, very sharp tool indeed where they can now inadvertently, through some you know, good-natured but unfortunate act, uh, blast you know, a lot. It, it's sort of that, that blast radius naturally extends over everything. And the other thing I think about is, um, at some point, there's returning, like the, the return on investment for automation kind of actually reaches a diminishing point, particularly when it starts to take away um, levels of isolation. Consider 
you know, like when I when I talk to folks about like running Kubernetes clusters, I'm, you know, they're, they're always asking me like, should I be running with federation technologies? Should I try to stitch these together into this big globally auto distributed awesome thing? I'm like, no. What you probably want to do is just run two small clusters and then have a pro, meaning a cloud provider, put a load balance between them, and that's going to give you decent amounts of isolation. And if you want to um, test something, you can. Or if you need to upgrade, you upgrade the one. And if stuff gets really weird, you just you know, point it over to the other. And then design auto-scaling so that any of those things can scale to, to meet your service requirements. And even if that scaling is imperfect, your MTTR in event is still pretty low because it will pretty quickly turn up, uh, turn up instances. Um, and so I definitely think that folks that go down this deep uh, you know, sort of federated cloud strategy where they're trying to build autonomous systems that span you know, potentially even multiple providers, um, are heading into a, a territory that they just need to be a little bit judicious about. And so um, it makes me, uh, makes me a little nervous. Um, something else that makes me um, nervous, and uh, I'm, I'm a little bit paranoid, like I can't help it. Right? Um, I, have a, I have a devious mind, and it's, a it's, it's sometimes a bad thing. Um, I look at the outages that the cloud providers have encountered today, right? And this, this is just like, it's well-meaning operators that fat finger something and something bad happens. And every time it happens, the cloud providers get better. They're very disciplined about post-morteming it. They introduce additional controls. They make sure that it doesn't happen again. The cloud platform itself gets better than it was previously, right? That's just a well-meaning operator fat fingering it. What happens if someone really bad gets into there? What happens if someone really bad gets into your cloud provider's control plane? What terrible things could they wreck on you? And how long would it take that cloud provider to get back up and running? Right? Like, these systems are complicated, right? Like, I don't know if, if you know, like, I, you know, I couldn't comment on sort of Google situation, but I don't know if Microsoft and Amazon have a strategy to reboot everything from the ground up. Good lord, just getting the S3 control plane back up after that last outage was it was a pretty big deal. You could be out for days, days and days and days, right? And um, that could really hurt your business. And so, you know, back to this whole MTTR thing. It's not crazy to be in a situation where if you really have to, within a day or two, you could be up and running somewhere else. And technologies like Kubernetes uh, will get you there. They will give you that platform that will let you get there. Um, and you will have to think about your own data replication. I mean, that's obviously a much gnarlier topic that hopefully I'll have a chance to chat to um, all of you about at some point. And so in closing, um, I, I see platforms like Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry as being an interesting formative technology in getting you to this world of multi-cloud. Um, I love the idea of being able to build and run applications that are essentially decoupled from infrastructure. It just opens up so much more utility. It gives you a way to hold a hedge. You know, if, even if you're a Microsoft user, uh, uh, an Amazon user, and you should be, they, they have a, a great service. It gives you the opportunity that if, if Google suddenly pulls ahead or Microsoft suddenly pulls ahead, you can kind of move, move your world over there. Um, I think a lot about this availability thing at the moment, particularly as I'm working with some big, sophisticated people to try to design out their kind of approach to this problem. And I'm converging on the idea that sometimes simpler is better. And sometimes just focusing on, on a relatively simple framework to bring down your MTTR. You know, when I look at pe you know, when people move on to Kubernetes, the first thing they're giddy about is that a lot of those application level events just become self-correcting, self, self right? You hit an oom um condition, you fail a health check, you get restarted. Uh, it's no longer a paging event. You know, like a lot of the operators that were, you get that, you'd have to come in and like, ah, oh, good lord, start, restart the machine or whatever it is, or restart the application. Uh, that just goes away. Um, and so there's so much utility in just focusing on managing down your MTTR, uh, whether it's the application level, whether it's at the operations level, whether it's the infrastructure level. Um, you will be well served by that. And then. The last point um, I think about a lot is having the opportunity to control your own destiny. Um, if your cloud does not have a strategy, if your private cloud does not have a strategy, if your hybrid cloud does not have a strategy for delivering a lot of these common services that can be put behind a provisioning API, uh, where an API call is, is giving you something and you don't need a ticket, it's not a cloud. And so definitely uh, manage, you know, control your own destiny, but also lean into the services stuff. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take you to a lot of great places. So thank you. That's, uh, that's it for me. I really appreciate the talk.